Um, it's my particularly great pleasure. Oh, no, no, this is going down again. Yeah, this is not, I'm sorry. This might happen again, so in that case, mm -hmm. you, you, I just let you sit in the darkness, I'm sorry. So, um, again, it's my great pleasure to, to welcome Mullen's colleague. Um, so, um, one, one, if, if you let me, I take the hour. Is that okay? <laughs> um, never mind. Um, so, um, Mullen has, um, has started in Casper, Wyoming, and then um, went to, um, through Yale, MIT, Arizona, New Mexico, Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics, Texas A&M University, of course, which, which they renamed in honor of Marlin to Texas Atomic and Molecular University, um, Princeton and Baylor University. So um, he also, he got, he got a lot of prizes, so let me just list some. Um, um, so he got Lamp Medal, Crescent Medal, Towns Award, Shallow Prize, Herbert Walter Award, Ice Medal, and he is a member of the National Academy of Science of, of the AAAS and of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Um, but but um, Marlin is actually much more, and I think all of this prizes and what positions and where he did his PhD, etc., describes only a very small part of Marlin. So, um, one of the things which stands out in my mind was that, that Marlon, um, let me remind you that this is Marlon O. Scully, always liked um, to, um, when we were students, told us that we should explain important physics to his alter ego, the man on the street. Um, but but let me let me tell you one story which has a lot of the important elements that make Marlon. I'm sorry, Marlon, for now that uh, but but this this is a story worth telling. So um, when 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 I was a grad student um, with with Marlon, um, he really um, liked to invite people from the German Studium Stiftung, um, and. Um, one day, when I was there, not for such a long time, he, he um, had me organize a meeting for them, which he sponsored. And in the preparation, everybody had been invited, and the people were there, and so on. And in the preparation of that, he asked me some advice on whether he should tell a particular story to, the, to this German student. So the story is the following. Uh, Marlin, as you need to know, actually also is not just an a, a, a academic researcher, he's also an inventor. And one of, of, the, one of the inventions and success stories that, what he, what, that he was particularly proud of was the following. He had invented a method how he could, and he actually did a movie of that, do you still have this? <laughs> In the movie of that, um, where you can cut open a, a cow, put some chemical in the dust, something to the tension of the surface tension of water, and then you plug it closed again, and then the cow actually can eat alfalfa without exploding. That's the problem. Normally, if you let cows eat alfalfa, they explode. So they can then eat alfalfa, and that makes them grow double as much. And that's, of course, for all these ranches in, in the, out in the West, it's fantastic. So however, for my kind of um, um, ecologically trained German sensitivities, there was so much wrong with that story that I said, well, you know, this is a really interesting story, but perhaps not such a good idea for you to tell that in this particular meeting. And Marlon hesitated a little bit and thought about that and said, you know, I'll tell it anyway. <laughs> And he did. And I can tell you it was a super success. The people all really loved it. <laughs> so, and with that, without further ado, here is Marlon. Mm -hmm. After that, I quit. <laughs> I'll tell you the story about Suzanne. Great scientist, bright young person, came into the office, had a nice solution. And I looked at it and said, 
Well, that's good. Atta boy. And I said, well, at least that shows I'm not sexist, right? And so she said, yes. And someday when your granddaughter comes in and shows me a calculation, I'll say, atta boy. She'll look at me and I'll say, that's just the way I was raised. <laughs> so she keeps doing great things. And uh, it's a pleasure to come back here and see her and her crew. And now let's see if I can go back. I guess I have the beginning here of a story I have enjoyed as a hobby, strictly as a hobby. Over the years, from the time when we were up the street working on the potential for gravity wave detectors in the 70s, it wasn't cold atoms or some such thing that uh, caused us all to think about interesting overlap between optics, quantum optics, and in this case, general relativity. And uh, Ray Weiss, Ray Weiss, great physicist that he is, was saying, you know, you can measure gravity wave detection, blah, 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 using a laser antenna. But there were people, including Einstein, that it's not even clear that there is something to measure. Maybe it's just a mathematical distortion of, of the metric. So we started studying in a more serious way those aspects of uh, that Now, 
plugging that into the angular contribution, you find that you pick up at the g time time component of the metric something that looks like gravity. The centrifugal force here being the analog to Einstein's equivalence principle. And in Einstein's case, of course, you remember that what he did was to look at the problem, first of all, of an object in an accelerating frame. So that if uh, uh, I'm accelerating uh, at a rate g, and uh, I use nothing more than uh, position equals 1 half at squared, calculate dt, and plug it back in, I get this contribution to the metric. And this then is the heuristic beginning that Einstein used to start studying curved space time and general relativity. Now, as you know, if I look at uh, the problem of a massive star, there will be a slightly more complicated metric. And I say slightly, of course, it's profoundly more complicated, profoundly more subtle. But the mathematics gives you a contribution here, which depends on the Schwarzschild radius, and a contribution in front of the dr component. Let's stick to two dimensions for the rest of the discussion. One time, and then the radial dimension. So that uh, everything we do from, from this point on for the next uh, like 10 or 12 or more view graphs will be just this simple idea and essentially special relativity. Toward the end, we have to get to, to uh, the real McCoy in order uh, to discuss and satisfy referees. Enough then for the history. I gave a series of lectures on these uh, topics in Les Uches back in the 80s. And then we more or less uh, went off in other directions, interested in things like uh, coherence effects in lasers, lasers without inversion, Suzanne's favorite, high index of refraction, and so forth. Now, let me, again, from the perspective of a graduate student in quantum optics, show you how to think about it, how to gauge, uh, how, how to uh, sense the size of things. So Hawking radiation is the first thing that you should get under your belt, not doing professional calculations, but just understanding the basic physics of the entropy of a black hole. Now, having interest in this subject once every 10 or so years, uh, a year ago, David Lee, a Harvard guy, got his PhD from Yale and got the Nobel Prize from the Swedes for liquid helium, helium-3 in particular, showing superfluidity. But uh, as you perhaps have followed, there are interesting analog black hole systems, interesting analog event horizons. And uh, Bell Unruh had an interesting such example using fluids, liquid helium, and uh, objects moving at greater or less than the velocity of sound. So uh, David was reading this, and he came into my office and uh, said, oh, David's at Texas Atomic and Molecular University. Oh, and so is Bill Unruh, by the way. So uh, he comes in, David, he says, look, why is the Bekenstein, Unruh, Bekenstein, sorry, Hawking radiation proportional to the area when entropy is always proportional to the volume? So how does that happen? So I said, well, uh, I'll get you a simple one-page derivation and come to see you later today. Well, it turned out it was even simpler than I thought. Uh, you can get it in just a few lines. If your friends with the concept of acceleration radiation are well, Bill Unruh in his ingenious paper back in the 70s, shortly after Hawking did his uh, famous work. So. Uh, Let's now just take a second and remind ourselves of what Hawking 
taught us from the dimensional analysis point of view. Okay? This is not, not uh, rigorous. We'll become rigorous in a bit. But first, let's start off seeing what these uh, effects are all about. And uh, let's think about it, think about Hawking radiation from the perspective of a black hole and a particle or a wave trapped in the potential, effective potential of the uh, system where R is the distance from the center of the black hole and RG is the gravitational Schwarzschild radius. So let's remember that tunneling from our freshman physics course goes like the length L uh, times a momentum divided by h bar and uh, <clears throat> will approximate the barrier size by the gravitational radius of the mass. Let's think about photons for the moment. Then we'll come back to, uh, uh, to the uh, Klein-Gordon equation after that. But uh, pretend that the mass is dimensionless, uh, is dimensionally an energy divided by c squared, okay, one electron volt, more or less, and uh, that this energy here is, again, of that order of magnitude. Plug this into the tunneling expression, the transmission, the probability of trans the transmission coefficient, the probability of leaking out, then, is quickly found to go large exponentially in the gravitational radius divided by the wavelength of the radiation. Uh, then if I equate this transmission coefficient to a thermal factor defining in this way the black hole temperature, I can solve for T black hole or T Hawking here, and I get something which is it is right, except for a factor of 1 over 4 pi. So, as I said, this is just a dimensional argument, but it's useful in that I can, starting from <clears throat> my cans, starting from this temperature then, derive the change in entropy associated with one such photon leaking out, and thus reducing the mass of the, of the, the uh, system uh, so that the change of energy of the system divided by the uh, temperature of the black hole, then plugging in just a couple of simple expressions, gives us what we want. Where the other simple expression is the idea that the area is the 4 pi times the gravitational radius squared. Okay, so we've got we have a factor of four, the Hawking radiation, but that doesn't really satisfy us. We would like more, and to that end, let me switch now back to doing real calculations as opposed to back of the envelope calculations, and uh, look at the wonderful result that Bill Unruh taught us back in the late 70s. He says, if I start with an atom in the ground state and I accelerate it through some region of space-time, and, and let's take this to be flat space for right now. And if in particular I also maybe have a mirror in the vicinity of the atom, then I show very quickly that with just an accelerated atom in flat space, I find that the probability of making a transition to the excited state or finding the atom in the excited state after it traverses the region of interest uh, goes like just this kind of, of uh, Boltzmann factor, where omega is the frequency difference between the upper and lower levels, and um, alpha is the acceleration frequency, A over C. So this is the answer that comes from doing these calculations, and the people who really did these things first were Jerry Moore, a person who worked with us uh, for many years as a quantum optics guy, did his thesis at Brandeis under Hugh Pendleton um, back in the 60s. And he really, in some sense, 
was the guy who got Steve Fulling interested in the problem. Fulling was a graduate student at Princeton and uh, took up this issue. What did Jerry Moore do? I remind myself again. He says, put an atom here and let a mirror accelerate toward the atom. And he found that when he did this, he got photons he made, neutral atom. So Fulling looked at it and said, well, let me go back and analyze transitions of this type. Let me do quantum field theory in curved space. So uh, he did his thesis, and it was after that that Hawking uh, took the problem uh, to uh, black hole uh, systems and did his famous result, got his famous result. So all this was, was in the air. Uh, Fulling, by the way, is a professor of physics at Texas A&M. And uh, uh, DeWitt is a, a guy who picked up where Jerry Moore left off and made some of these problems so, uh, much more rigorous. And finally, oh, let me step back on. Yeah. Peter Maloney, quantum optics uh, uh, physicist, who writes these excellent books, wrote a book called something like Quantum, quantum Thermodynamics, Quantum Electrodynamics, or perhaps. Uh, quantum vacuum. What's it called? Quantum vacuum. The quantum vacuum. Fair enough. And in that book, he talks about unruh radiation. And he says an accelerated detector responds as if it were at rest in a thermal vacuum of temperature. So, just what we gave a moment before. And this acceleration divided by the Boltzmann constant C. He says that's hardly obvious why this should be. He was writing his book in, in uh, the 80s, I guess, and he says uh, uh, it took 50 years from the famous days, 1925, up to 1975 when Unruh came along. Well, I read this particular section in his book, and uh, I was challenged to come up with an alternative uh, a perspective from that which Bill Unruh offered. And I also found recently uh, this picture of Feynman's blackboard. So Feynman has a list of uh, problems that he wanted to treat. And on his blackboard, he listed he would like to understand the acceleration temperature, one of the issues to learn. So keeping with this theme of quantum optics, let me show you what we were doing and what we did back uh, uh, 20 years ago, in which we dropped, in our mind's eye, atoms into a gravitating uh, system not necessarily a black hole, a neutron star. And uh, let's, for purposes of this calculation, think of a ring cavity so that light goes in uh, a ring. Uh, and uh, as the atoms fall through, they interact with this traveling wave radiation. Now, we usually think of absorption promoting an atom from the ground state to the excited state. But there's another term which we neglect, which promotes the atom and emits a photon. Creation operator A dagger for a photon of the wave vector K. And uh, you raise the atomic system, sigma dagger and power spin matrices. So we call this the sigma dagger A dagger term. And here, of course, sigma dagger, but it's annihilation operator. So this is sigma dagger A. That's everybody's cup of tea. That's what we do in quantum optics all the time. Oh, and we have decay, where it's the lower end operator, sigma A dagger. Okay? But there are these two terms that we typically throw away. But now, with an atom in the ground state, we must not throw those terms away. And uh, if you do some special relativity. Uh, oh, one of my collaborators on this was Federico Capasso, who you know is a 
great expert on the dynamic cashmere effect. That's, that's Jerry Moore's effect. And uh, in particular, now, let me think with you about an atom accelerating through space. And uh, <clears throat> it uh, is interacting with the radiation field as it accelerates. So let's take a single mode radiation field. Later we'll sum on all modes. The coupling constant G is, of course, the matrix element, coupling A and B, times the electric field per photon, square root of h bar omega. The uh, annihilation operator, the positive frequency contribution to the electric field operator is here, of the frequency nu wave vector k, and the lowering and raising operators for the atom are, again, uh, here and here. So, unfortunately, it's this term times that term that I care about. But uh, in particular, what I really have to do is say, if I'm riding along with the atom, I'm going to keep time in conjunction with the frequency of the atom, the energy spacing divided by h bar, omega sub atom. Now, the photon is interacting with this atom as it's being accelerated, but the time in the frame of the atom, the proper time for the atom is just tau, that's simple, but looking at the radiation contained in this cavity, think of it that way, or this traveling wave, is, uh, first of all, I just do a special relativistic calculation, the time t in the uh, uh, stationary frame of the radiation field is connected to the proper time in the accelerated field by this hyperbolic secant contribution. And the position z, same configuration, goes like the hyperbolic cosine. So the sines, hyperbolic sines and cosine uh, results are with us always in this problem. And they're, of course, very reminiscent of the boost factors that we typically think of in conjunction with special relativity. Now, plug in, let's look back here a second. Plug, whoop. Plug in the time t and position z. Okay, so put these guys here and here. Do the first contribution to uh, uh, the U matrix or do first order perturbation theory, said more simply. Uh, and so I'm going from the vacuum ground state of my atom. Some people call it detector because they want to know what's the likelihood that the system is excited. My V that we've just been talking about, and now I'm going to the excited atom, one photon emitted, and I'm going to plug in my hyperbolic cos, cos and cinch contributions, do that integral, square it, and lo and behold, I get just what you would like to see. Namely, the probability now of finding the atom excited is proportional to some factors out front, matrix elements and other stuff, density of state kind of factors, times, please denote now, a plump number of photons at some temperature kind of factor, where if I now equate this to h bar omega atom over kt sub unru, I can solve for the unru temperature, and I see that the atom is excited as if it's interacting with a thermal background at temperature T younger. That's kind of neat. And uh, 
one thing you might ask right away is you might say, well, okay, I, I followed your sigma dagger a dagger stuff, but what? that was the first question I asked when I did this. And at that time, Suskin, Leonard Suskin was in residence at Texas A&M, so I went to him and said, uh, hey, how come it's thermal? And he said, that's all you can get. So I will show you that that's not true. It's not always thermal. And that, uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, it is thermal under these conditions, but not always. Well, back to Peter Maloney. Thank you, Peter, for making a strong statement that clarifies the problem. But please to know that it's really very simple, the physics behind this whole thing. Think first of parametric oscillation. I send in blue laser photons, and I get a red one and an orange one. And nobody's surprised at that. Well, neither am I surprised if I'm accelerating my atom, and the force that's necessary to accelerate that atom <coughs> through some distance gives me an energy, center of mass energy, and now I have, in return, the energy that it takes to excite the atom and the energy associated with the emitted photon. So the atomic center of mass acts as the pump, pump driving both the atom and the field. Acceleration, radiation, and parametric oscillator physics are very much the same. Now, moving along, let's uh, go back to David Lee's question, and let's ask about atoms falling into a black hole on now with the answer that we picked up from uh, uh, doing Unruh's problem this way. And by the way, Unruh didn't do the problem this way at all. Uh, what he did was to follow along the lines of Hawking's calculation in which they look at different cells of space-time. I like to think of it as different modes of a radiation field, noticing that those modes are effectively coupled by a kind of uh, Bogolubov coefficient, a kind of squeezing operator in the language of quantum optics. So they didn't do at all what we're doing, and, and uh, uh, I'm now going to apply these results, the results of the sigma dagger, a dagger variety, to the problem of an, a beam of atoms falling into a black hole, but I'm putting a mirror here in order that the photons generated by uh, the uh, tumbling in the sense of the early view graph is uh, reflected away. I want to be able to look back out here and look at the statistics and look at the uh, uh, energy distribution and frequency of this radiation. Now, we're going to do that calculation in some detail, but what we find is that the probability that these atoms decay and emit a photon of frequency nu is no longer flat. Uh, now remember, what we had was omega. Now we have the frequency of light. So it's a Planckian's, it's a Planck spectrum. And uh, that's, that's interesting. We'll come back to that later. And this gives us insight into the Einstein equivalence principle from a new point of view. So still using the results that we had on the first couple of view graphs, um, I'm sorry, two back, not the first couple, but two view graphs back. We found this in photon, thermal photon number. So we now look at the statistical probability of having n photons, and uh, we remember that that goes like n bar to the nth divided by such a factor, um, first calculated by Landau. And uh, we now use that probability of having n photons together with the von Neumann definition of entropy, plug in the expression involving the n bar and find in just a few lines that the flux, the time rate of change of uh, 
entropy streaming out of the black hole is given by such an expression where n dots the number of thermal photons generated by this infall. Now let me pause there and say this is not the radiation generated by a black hole as per the Hawking calculation. It's related, but it's different. <coughs> so, we've got everything we need. Yeah. 
and another term which is governed by off-diagonal elements of the density matrix, reminiscent of squeezing, precisely the squeezing properties. And so we see that we don't always have thermal radiation, and under some conditions, this uh, might be of interest in questions associated with information loss. But, uh, so let's write this up and send it in and see why it doesn't work. See what the referee says. So almost universally, <clears throat> when you talk to people who are willing to think about this for a minute, they say something like this. Look, the atom is in free fall, and therefore, the acceleration is zero. So you can't have anything like the acceleration radiation UNRU analysis working for you. The gravitational acceleration business, which we've applied all our equivalence principle, is not precisely correct. And I'll show you in a moment what that means. But in fact, it is true, and we will prove that to the satisfaction of our critics. Uh, it is true that you get this black hole engendered radiation in the sense that if we ask for the light emitted by an atom as it falls through the event horizon, <clears throat> we show that the atoms falling through a cavity or past a mirror into a black hole emit acceleration radiation, which looks like Hawking radiation. We call this horizon bright acceleration radiation. And uh, <clears throat> so, first did this calculation and showed it to Steve Fulling, the local card-carrying expert on general relativity, an excellent scientist in the Department of Mathematics, in fact. Uh, and he said, well, I'm not so sure. Uh, send it to Don Page. Oh, we, by the way. Anatoly Shvizinski, Wolfgang Schleich, and I were the guys <coughs> perpetrating this, this calculation. And, uh, Fulling uh, saying, well, I'm not sure. And uh, we sent it to Don Page, who, as some of you know, uh, was one of Hawking's uh, close associates. He lived with Hawking for three years and uh, was essentially the scientific scribe and did several pages, uh, <laughs> several page paper, page and Hawking papers. Uh, excellent guy. But that was precisely his objection. Free fall, no acceleration. So, we're doing special relativity plus the equivalence principle. Now let's quit that. Let's just go get our copy of Chandrasekhar in which he solves every problem and find our problem and calculate using the proper trajectories the probability that a photon is emitted. Now, let's do it in a box, okay? It makes it much easier to talk about if you're thinking about cavity quantum electrodynamics such that the radiation field is in the box. And I can show you why later, but for right now, let's start with the atom initially in the lower state, falls through a hole in the box. And again, we're, we're doing sigma dagger, a dagger, except that now, the T of tau and Z of tau uh, results are not the same at all. It's not hyperbolic sines and cosines. This time, the atom is, in uh, a, a certain sense, <coughs> thought of properly as uh, uh, stationary. And uh, the radiation field is in one way of looking at it, thought of as accelerating. That's something we'll come back to in a moment. But let me not uh, confuse things. Let me simply say that tau is the proper time of the atom in a gravitational field. And now the radiation 
has to be uh, properly analyzed such that the time and space quantities are calculated according to the Einstein field equations. So you can do that. And uh, by the way, it's not done typically. It's not done in the, in the books. The uh, uh, heroic papers use something very different. So it's, it's always this thermal light point of view. And I'll come back to that later. But uh, I'd like to alert you to the fact that here's where knowing the little quantum optics helps. So you learn this stuff from doing <clears throat> some simple uh, GNU new algebra. Plug it in to our probability first order perturbation theory, integrating from one is the Schwarzschild radius out to infinity. And you find the answer, which is what I indicated earlier, namely that the frequency nu now dominates the game. So that's kind of neat. We were excited about that. And um, we showed this to Don Page, and uh, it converted him. He liked this too. And so we now point out that, in summary, the atom falls to the bottom of the box, uh, is excited, and a photon is emitted. Now it will fall through a little hole. We don't want it to hit the box. And we want to take into account the issues of non-adiabaticity and adiabaticity. We'll do that carefully. But when we're done, we have a comparison between three problems. So first of all, we have the Jerry Moore uh, kind of problem, or better said, the unknown problem. It's an atom which is being accelerated. And we have a flat spectrum. Then we do the problem in which there's a mirror, which is accelerating here, the mirror is stationary. And we find that, once again, the atom is accelerated as the mirror moves away. And if you like, you can go back and think in terms of this box that we had earlier. Uh, and uh, uh, one mirror is enough. Uh, when you do the calculation this way, you get the answer, which comes from doing just special relativity of an accelerated mirror and a stationary atom. Now I do general relativity, and we're falling into a black hole, and I'm going to put here my ubiquitous uh, mirror to hold out the Hawking radiation. The general relativists say that what we're doing is providing a way of ensuring that we have a vacuum out here called the Boulevard vacuum. Those are just technical uh, ways that are helpful from some points of view, but not ours. All we're doing is the calculation of the trajectories. And so please denote that an atom falling into a black hole, gravitational problem, is almost exactly the same result, exactly the same probability of excitation associated with a stationary atom and the accelerated frame. So here's the equivalence principle personified. We're not doing a simple elevator. We're doing a much more demanding problem. And it's in this sense that we <clears throat> go back to the famous review article by uh, Ginsburg and his associate Prola of 87. And they encouraged us to think about such problems. It was obvious that Einstein was thinking about classical physics. The question of whether or not the equivalence principle holds for the description of phenomena for which the quantum nature is important is by no means trivial. And uh, in particular, then, we're doing this quantum problem as we like to think, uh, giving us a license to do 
general relativity. Let's see. Maybe that's the end of my talk. <laughs> yeah, not so bad. I've got one more trick, one more story to tell you. And I, I don't even need the view graphs. It's better without it. I went to a wonderful physicist named Dick Arnwood, Harvard student of Schwinger. And this was back in 03. And I said, hey, what's the physics behind unknown radiation? And he said, time is like imaginary temperature. And I uh, and said to him, that's not physics. That is probably not even true. That's baloney. And I want the physics behind this. He's, he's an excellent guy, a good friend, good physicist. And he said, well, I don't know. That's all I know. And I ignored what he was saying for many years, but preparing these lectures a few months ago to present elsewhere, I decided to try it. And he's right. And if somebody would make this thing come back, I'll show you in just a few lines how it goes. How do you think that would do it? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So time is up, and I'll just indicate for you how it goes. So if you remember from the it's called the KMS formalism, Kubo, Martin, Schwinger. They show that. If you're working with a system in thermal equilibrium, and everything is defined here, A of T, Heisenberg picture, is a trace of rho. And rho is thermal. And uh, you put in the e to the minus beta H, no cost to the customer. <clears throat> You'll then shuffle around a little bit with the uh, uh, exponential factors, and since this is all h, I can can add them together in the exponent. And so I see that the time appearing here in this thermal uh, correlation function, it's not a Green's function here yet, no time order or any such, but uh, this correlation function looks exactly like the correlation function indicated here but um, with the uh, time displaced by i times beta, beta is 1 over kt. Well, that's interesting, because now, if I use the fact that this uh, acceleration radiation tells me that uh, I've got a hyperbolic cosine coming to work for me, then um, let's Go to the classical moment where I can factorize this. You don't have to do that, but it makes it easier to think about. And let's also look at the fact that x of t, x of t is uh, periodic in imaginary time. Okay, so I'm going to plug in tau is i t i times such a factor, uh, a couple steps here, won't worry with the details, and you find that equating this to what we had on the previous page gives you exactly the unknown temperature. I consider that to be very surprising and worthy of, of uh, further study, but uh, it's well known to most people who know it well, and uh, Steve Foley is one of the guys who wrote papers on this. And I think it's absolutely intriguing to see the flow of logic from uh, quantum optics to many body theory to uh, these kinds of problems in, in black hole physics. And in conclusion, I'll just note that if you want to go back and do a Hawking problem and read Steve Foyne's book on gravity, 
and quantum mechanics, what you're really finding is that you're doing squeezing. Squeezing in the sense of quantum optics and the uh, two-mode squeeze state business is really what we're all about. So for a stationary cavity atom accelerates through the cavity, you get unmoved. Now, put the atom at this point and let the cavity accelerate by the atom. Now you change the normal modes. You're generating a new kind of boundary value problem. And with that normal mode, do the calculation and the following ring work, you get precisely the same result. So that uh, I'll quit there, but uh, just uh, note that there are many interesting problems here that I would like to uh, have time to talk about with graduate students who are interested. And it's a lot of fun to see this uh, old chestnut from different points of view. Thank you for your attention. Classical special relativity, right up to the point that you're forced to do the calculation in a gravitational field. Yeah, but at the end, the effective theory would be I'm just sorry. the effectively the theory would be that an atom which sees a refractive index, right, which changes in time. Fair enough. And changes in time because I'm accelerating yes, through yes, a static of course, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. That's right. So then basically this last two slides summarize your talk. Yep. Right. <clears throat> yep. Is it true or not? Yes, that's that's well said. Yeah. And in particular, I love this sort of yeah. up there. Yeah, that one. Because for a while I couldn't understand how Jerry Moore. Did you ever meet Jerry Moore? Remember? Okay, before your time. But anyway, how can an atom or someone system here respond to a mirror which is moving away. And uh, you can see, well, it's sitting here, and there may be no radiation in the cavity, but the normal modes, the modes in which vacuum fluctuations reside, are these now new modes, the Rindle modes. And Jerry Moore didn't do the problem this way. He wasn't able to get a simple answer, but uh, uh, as uh, Mikhail says, uh, as one who knows quantum optics might be encouraged to think, this summarizes the physics. But uh, I think a, I know Bill Unruh likes to think of it this way. So he's always thinking of atoms moving through a thermal background. And uh, that's something that I'm trying to get comfortable with so we can see if the insights that those people bring to the problem can somehow lead us to new ways to think about it as well. Can I, so, so this, when, when you showed the slide with the question of the way, um, yeah. and then basically directly after that you, you showed this, this question about um, that, that, that the general relativity was, was um, developed for, for classical particles or for classical physics. Right. Um, right. Isn't the same questions that the referees ask for, for your particular problem of the, of the excitation or the excitation of an atom, don't we have exactly the same question if you would 
just have an electron in an accelerated gravity field? In, in some sense, yes. <clears throat> how much is due to Maxwell and how much is due to Einstein? Exactly. But, but, that's, you, but that's exactly the point. Right? Your, your point is, is uh, on target and you're only about 30 years late because Bell, <laughs> you know, famous Bell inequality Bell was an accelerated physicist. And so he asked the question, consider a spin one half system. Now it's accelerating, going in a circle, and here's my two level system. Can I maintain that the probability of finding the atom in the excited state is a little bit different than what just ordinary synchrotron radiation calculations would give me? And he found it, yes, he could, and uh, maintained uh, uh, ever after that, in fact, only radiation has been seen, and this the reason that the uh, probability of being in the excited state, the spin up state, mm -hmm. is a little bit different than what you would have thought. But, but isn't, um, doesn't that mean, in a sense, that, that your two-level atom can be described basically completely by a classical platform? Uh, well, I, I argue not in the sense that I'm doing spontaneous submission, okay? If I had an atom in the excited state and I ask what's the probability that it decays, then we all agree that, okay, that takes quantum mechanics. If I have an atom in the ground state and I'm pushing it around, but it's in the vacuum, then what's really happening is a spontaneous submission, but your life scale problem, but it's spontaneous submission upside down. So in that sense, I would say you know, it is quantum mechanical. But there's no quantum gravity. It's all classical gravity with a quantum mechanical or, or quantum field to it. I, I stop now. <laughs> so, well, there's something like a hard time understanding under right? section five. When you did a comparison uh, of those three different cases of different sorts of radiation in, in general relativity, um, can, can you just bring that slide up, if, you, if that's possible, so I can ask the question? Yeah. <coughs> See if I'm thinking of the one that you're thinking of. Is it that one? No, the, you had three different cases, and you compared them side oh, by side. Okay, yeah, let's keep going back. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the right-hand one um, is not doesn't seem to have any dependence on the distance from the black hole. Why is that? Ah, yeah, it, it is uh, written with new sub infinity. So I'm moving a long distance away from the black hole, and the radiation is redshifted as it propagates away, and the new infinity is given by this equation, mu equals blah blah mu infinity. So I, are you assuming the atom? at distance r uh, is very, very near rg. It's almost at the, so, the surface of the black hole. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a smart guy. I wonder if he's asking this question. How can you compare uniform acceleration with falling in a curved space which is not uniform? Is that what's in your mind? Because that's a key yeah. point. Yeah. And in fact, that's exactly right. You might say, well, where is the black hole? I'm just following the gravitational field. So why is the neutron star good enough? And the answer is, if you go back to the metric of, of, of Schwarzschild and you expand about r sub g, r sub gravity, then you find that the gravitational field, surprisingly enough, right at the horizon, looks just like linear gravity, looks just like uh, a uniformly accelerated particle. And so that's that's a very key point. That's Federico Capasso's point also. He was one of the referees. And being a friend, I knew who he was. So he wrote and said, how can how can it be that everything is a function of R here, but not there? and yet you claim you get the same kind of answer. Very good. Now can I publish? <laughs>
not the referee. <laughs> it's out. <laughs> So if there's no really urgent question anymore, thank you very much for